Um, uh, if you want to put your cushion down, this will also be we will look at them later in case we don't get to them in this session. What can you expect from today's webinar? So this is an introductory webinar. We are very aware that maybe not all of you have ever worked on EU trade policy before. So this session, this first session, really wants to show the parts, the bits and pieces of EU trade strategy, in particular focusing on raw materials. And we are cu cutting this down a little bit. And we, in this webinar series, we will only look at raw materials in terms of fossils and minerals. I know there's lots of organic um, raw materials out there. We're not focusing on them, even though they are very important pillar of EU trade policy. Today, uh, we want to talk about um, where do some of the raw materials that we need for the energy transition come from and what steps the EU is taking to secure access to these raw materials and how they expand the access that might already be there. Um, so there is what what to what to expect from from today's webinar. What we won't do in this work on very specific case works. Um, um, sorry, can you all? I think you're cutting off a bit. No. So I think I'm back. Yeah, you can are. You hear me? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Berlin and its internet connection. Um, it's kind of a surprise I'm still here. <laughs> so sorry, sorry about that. Um, the recording is still running, I hope. So what we want to do is take a very deep dive into WTO history. We want to look ahead and really give you a step-by-step -step insight of what the EU trade policy is about today and how you could eventually get involved and why it is important to learn about the EU trade agenda. Um, we will though do more specific case workers in the other sessions and I mean an introductory session is also about to kind of water your mouth a little bit about what is going on in the next sessions to come so please consider uh, signing up for the other sessions and join us with more beautiful guests and experts that have been in the trade world for a very very long time um, I'm sure that's going to be exciting um, So, I have the glorious um, task to kind of set the scene for Lucia a little bit. So, I just want to give you some very short kind of um, thoughts or some ideas how to approach this very big chunk of information, EU trade policy and raw materials. And I think the first step is to consider that um, it's important to link these two, two conversations on energy transition and raw materials uh, and trade policy to understand and to correctly interpret the current EU trade policy agenda. Um, so if you look at, for example, um, phrases from the new industrial strategy, I took a little, um, a little bit of text here on the left side is that they very um, uh, consciously identified that obviously critical raw materials are crucial for markets such as e-mobility, batteries, renewable energies, pharmaceuticals, aerospace, defense, and digital applications. But on the other hand, and that you can see on the right side, um, uh, the demand as these sectors expand, the demand on uh, certain minerals will obviously expand with the demand on certain se sectors. And there's no way we can cover those so far. Um, so how is the EU, European Commission who negotiates EU trade policy on behalf of all member states approaching this? Um, if we look back, like every, every minister, uh, every trade commissioner is coming up with their own kind of strategy where they phrase, where they put in words how they want to approach EU trade policy. And if we look back, uh, for example, to Trade for All in 2015, Cecile Malmström, uh, she came up with this trade um, strategy, um, Trade for All, saying that the Commission will, as part of a broader work, to create a European Energy Union and in line with, raw material, with the Raw Materials Initiative, propose an energy and raw materials chapter in each trade agreement. And we'll talk about more about this later, like how is EU trade policy um, organized? But 
it's very important for you to keep in mind that this is a strategic and very conscious step that they're taking to materialize uh, the need for raw materials and for broader export, like import into the European Union um, for more secured access to incorporate these in the current trade agreements. Um, if you look back on the trade policy review from 21, um, they also phrase it very specifically to the EU's waste network of bilateral tra trade agreements as they also, so these trade agreements help secure access to third country markets for our renewable energy industry and ensure distorted trade and investment in the raw materials and energy goods that are required to secure the necessary supplies to support the transition to climate neutral economies. So I just want to emphasize this, this, this is a very conscious strategic decision that the European Commission is taking, and we can see this manifested in the current trade agreements or in the um, negotiations, I should rather say. So let's focus just a little bit, um, just for you to, to, to dive into um, what, what are these strategic um, trade material, trade <laughs> the strategic materials that we are looking at up at. Um, so, I mean, the challenge has been obviously identified. The, the need is rising. I, sh I showed you the, the infographic before. So the EU has so far classified 30 raw materials as critical in the um, raw materials, critical, uh, critical raw materials initiative. We don't want to dive too much into it, but the interesting part for us as trade nerds is that this, these are these materials are critical depending on their supply risk and economic importance, but not so much on their impact on people or the environment, which you could eventually um, expect by such a name. Um, but it's if you take a look at it, at the current list, and this is getting updated this year. So it's interesting for you to keep this in mind. This is why we picked this about this in the last session, session four. Nelly, I think we lost. Yeah, we lost. Sorry about that. I think I will just... Um, you want to pass it? Not, to not, not show my presentation ah. anymore. I think maybe the the data is just just a bit too much for it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I'll send you the, the the link later, and I think I can maybe skip this part. On the point we wanted to make is that this session will focus on the first pillar of the raw materials initiative, which is access to materials on the world market, and. The question that Lucia will investigate for us as well is how does an FDA or free trade agreement secure market access? So uh, it will obviously guarantee rules. It will push a massive liberalization agenda. And the most important point is that it will restrict policy space. Um, some of it is through prohibition of certain um, tools like export quotas, um, access is a better access for local markets and so on but the other rules the other thing is also that once you agree to an agreement you have signed and ratified it these agreements don't adapt anymore over time or very hardly so they last forever because most of them don't have an expiration date and most of them put down specific privileges for example for big european companies i mean most of you are probably aware of the investor state dispute settlement we talked about it a lot in the ttip debate it gives very privileged rules to the big companies but it's a one-way street um, against uh, the governments and the people so it's important to understand that we are talking about a new generation of trade agreements and these agreements have a very broad scope and it's about many things before like back in the 90s also in particular if you look at the bilateral investment agreements these agreements they're around 20 pages some of them uh, the NAFTA goes 600 pages but nowadays the modern generation of trade agreements that are negotiated by the European Commission they're around three to six thousand pages big and they have like many subdivisions so they're looking at very different 
um, aspects, um, everything that kind of influences trade and influences their position of power. So it's not so much about tariffs anymore. It's really about how to shape international regulations. Um, and they're adding a bunch of soft laws to it in order to pass through other aspects. So the whole debate that you are, might be familiar with around trade and sustainable development chapters, but also gender chapters and other um, specific awareness um, chapters. Uh, most of these chapters are soft laws, not all of them, but mostly, and uh, they are confronted with a part, a heavy um, enforceable chapters that are around probably, for example, privileged um, privileges for uh, cooperation in terms of investment protection. So this new generation is about limiting policy space and it is about expansion. It, these trade agreements are not passed to um, uh, have more recycling of raw materials, to have more circular economy. These agreements are passed in order to um, maintain a system that has been in place for a long time and to expand this system. So once you agreed to an agreement, it's hard to get out of it and you will basically run with the expansion agenda. But I'll keep it so far. Um, sorry, the presentation didn't work. I'll send this um, around afterwards. And I'm very happy for everyone who joined later to welcome today's guest, Lucia from the Transnational Institute in the Netherlands. And the floor is yours, Lucia. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, I will share a PowerPoint. I hope there's no problem with mine. Um, let me see. Okay. Do you see the whole page? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I know this is a launch <laughs> session, so probably you're all having your, your break right now and eating. Um, I will just... Yeah, like the introduction that Nelly gave um, is quite relevant because like the session we pretend to do today is just like an opening of many topics that we're going to go a bit more in depth in the different sessions. Um, but I guess for many of us that have been working around trade and investment issues, we have had like this sense during the last year. Lucias, sorry to jump in, but we can see your presenters mode. Is there a way oh, okay. you can switch that to full screen mode? mode? I have no idea how to do that. Thank do you I... so much. Wait. <laughs> it's like we've been using PowerPoint for like 20 years and I still have no idea how to do different types of showing. It's working now, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Anyway, so... As I was saying, um, yeah, for many of us that have been following trade policy, we did, we're realizing like in the last years that there's some new trends showing, um, and in particular, new trends that have to do a lot with geopolitics and what's going on in the world. And now specifically on the energy crisis and everything has to do with the, the urgency for um, especially EU member countries, but also other like hegemonic countries to look for new spaces or new territories to exploit and to, you know, secure um, access to materials needed for the green energy transition. So until now, we have become like quite some like very good experts at looking at the specifics of the treaties to understand what the different chapters are about, the articles, ISDS in particular, but now it's a moment to broaden the scope and to understand all of this in a, in a, more like in a geopolitical um, map, no? Because it's really like, now it's like really about seeing like how to secure this access to these treaties and who is going to become like the, the, the companies, the corporations that are going to be um, in charge of leading this transition. And that also means that they have to have access to the, to the materials and minerals. So yeah, just to say that it's an important moment now to you know, gather all our intelligence from different organizations, those that are working more on environment and climate, energy, 
to you know start like processing different um, pieces of the puzzle to understand like the broader um, image. So we're gonna give like the input from the trade perspective, but it's great that if somebody in the audience is a bit more expert on energy specific or materials, that you know we can also try to build up on this knowledge. Um, so anyway, in the last um, years, we have been seeing um, either new uh, treaties that have been negotiated or the modernization of all the agreements, not like opening again negotiations of some of these agreements that already existed. Um, and these are the, the agreements that already include today um, a chapter specifically on energy and raw materials chapter or ERM chapters. Um, so for the moment, we have at least that we know EU Chile, which was concluded, the text was concluded uh, in November 2022. EU Australia, the negotiations opened in 2018, so they're continuing to negotiate. EU Indonesia, um, negotiations also opened in 2016. They were already like on their 11th round. And as we've heard from our colleagues, and there's going to be a specific session on Indonesia, um, they are accelerating quite a lot the, the finalization of the of the text maybe this year or next year. Um, EU-Mexico, the, the negotiations also concluded in April 2020. Um, EU-New Zealand concluded in June 2022. And we've just heard that the, the Commission has already sent like the text to the Council and it's looking, you know, for the signing and ratification of the of the treaty and this can go quite quick so we do have to pay a bit of attention to this treaty now um and EU India is a big question mark still if it's going to include or not the energy and raw materials chapter apparently from the EU side they are pushing to include it but India is being a bit more hesitant um but I'm gonna concentrate on the EU Chile because until now, it's like the most exemplary um, agreement because it's like the most elaborated one. And it's, you know, the one that includes a lot more obligations and restrictions. Um, and I think this is something interesting to notice that Australia and New Zealand, the, the chapters on energy and raw materials are a bit less restrictive than the ones that um, are being negotiated with Chile and, and Mexico and etc. So this is the, main, the mandate of negotiations of the EU Chile agreement. And if you can read, I think what becomes clear is that the mandate, at least from the EU, is very clear, which is to preserve the interests of the industry, of the energy industry, and the access to the markets uh, of raw materials and, invest and European investments for the extraction of these um, raw materials. Um, so looking at the EU Chile agreement, Wait, sorry, I'm going to say this out. Yeah, looking at the EU Chile agreement, there's a list of what energy goods are included, materials are included in the in the agreement. No? So, for example, on on raw materials, we have um, ore and other precious metals. Um, we also have materials such as copper and other um, and other metals, and also we have minerals like lithium. It's confused in this. <laughs> I put it there, but anyway, lithium is also included, of course. Um, hydrocarbons, renewable fuels that include biofuels, biomass, and hydrogen, green hydrogen. Um, but the the agreement also includes like also like solid fuels in the annex, and also crude oil, oil products, natural gas, including liquefied natural gas and liquefied petroleum gas. So it's not really only about um, renewable or sustainable um, energy. Um, but it's interesting to see that the agreement um, recognizes already like these fuels as like the renewable fuels, not like biofuels, biomass and hydrogen, which is, you know, it's also like being de debated in different um, forums, no? whether like if this could be considered or not uh, renewable, but the treaty is very clear to include them already. Um, um, the Besides like the annex that explains like what type of materials and minerals are included, the chapter includes a lot of obligations, as I said, and restrictions as to as to what you know what type of protections are these um, corporations going to have from both sides of the Atlantic. No, 
Um, in Article 4, for example, it talks about the monopoly. So it says that no party shall designate or maintain a designated import or export um, monopoly. Article 5 says that a party shall not impose a higher price for exports of energy goods or raw materials to other party than the price charged for such good when destined to the domestic um, market. So there's like um, some um, obligations on export pricing practices. It's true that Chile um, at the end of the negotiations um, made like an amendment to this specific article saying that there could be some I am exceptions in particular to the, you know, like the pricing um, strategic um, sectors for Chile that are like in the industrial sector, for example. But there's a lot of wording and limitations saying that none of these, um, none of these like reductions or new inclusions can damage European um, markets. So at the end, it's all based on like how they're going to interpret also like the, the wording, no? Um, Article 6 talks about the supply of energy goods shall be based on market principles. And I remark here, I emphasize here market principles because it's becoming clear now that the trade and trade agreements are all about, um, you know, like market economy. Um, Article 7, it talks about provisions concerning the authorization for exploration and production of, of raw materials. Um, anyway, these are like very specific restrictions that are included in the treaties on how energy goods should be treated. There's also a section on cooperation on standards, uh, which those of you that remember, I don't know, like previous work that we've done on regulatory cooperation on TTIP and CETA, um, it was, you know, like this, like independent body or organ that was going to establish um, like a, like a, yeah, like a standardization of what uh, should be, you know, considered, well, what, what are those trade barriers, no, that should be revised. Um, and those trade barriers that prevent um, a free flow of um, trade among the two, two parties that are signing the agreement. And in this concrete example, it's on energy goods, no? So it says, with a view to preventing, identifying, and eliminating unnecessary technical barriers to trade in energy goods and raw materials, the provisions contained in this chapter shall apply to all energy goods. Um, also, another chapter on cooperation on energy and raw materials, it says the parties shall cooperate with a view to reduce or eliminate measures that in themselves or together with other measures could distort trade and investments, including technical, regulatory, and economic nature affecting energy or raw uh, materials. So again, like a lot of wording on, well, restrictions now on how the trade and raw materials should be looked at from the two parties. Um, as Nelly said, there is like a, yeah, like the, what are those you critical raw materials? And I think this is important also to, to take in mind because for the EU, it's not really about um, critical in the, in the sense of like, that there is not enough, um, yeah, that there's not enough disposition of the, of the material itself, but that it's um, critical because of um, the supply risk and economic importance for the EU. So this is why like the list of raw materials keeps expanding no? um, throughout the years. And we're expecting a new list to probably be updated in the next um, weeks. Um, and it's also like when we think about the type of scarcity that we're talking about, we can talk about economic scarcity, physical scarcity, but also geopolitics. And the European dependence on materials is so high that they of course want to put like a security, this is like a big security of supply at risk, no? So, and especially if we take into account that some of these materials are only mined in certain countries. So it's not like, um, like the, the specification of which countries have these materials are very small, no? Um, and what if these countries apply trade restrictions or they reform their domestic laws? For example, Mexico is now passing a new um, mine reform that also pretends to put some limitations into the pricing, for example, of lithium. No, so if it's li little countries that have some specific materials and they start to um, apply domestic laws that you know suppose for the EU not uh, access to these materials, then that becomes uh, a scarcity for the EU. Um, and this is where 
FTAs come as a big importance, no? Because they're actually trying to interrupt that process from happening, no? Um, so, so yeah, so of course, like European, the Euro member countries have a high dependence on materials. Um, for example, the Europe imports, Europe imports 47% of its aluminium, um, and China controls 60% of that global production. Um, and of course, like, when we talk about critical raw materials, we're not only talking about green technologies, we're also talking about digitalization agenda. And there's a lot of these critical raw materials that are going to be destined also for defense and aerospace. Um, this is a map where we can see um, the global production of critical raw materials, where it is. And you can see that a lot of them are in China. You also have the lithium triangle in Chile um, and Argentina. Uh, and then, you know, also Australia has lithium and New Zealand also has important materials. So, and Mexico also has like key raw materials. All of this, um, you know, needed to produce batteries and everything that has to do with our so-called green um, technology. And I guess this map, you know, what it eventually shows is that, you know, the EU has very little to offer in this new geopolitics. Um, another, another table you can see here is, this is what like the EU has considered um, critical raw materials. So you see like cobalt, for example, wait, I don't see because I have something there. Well, you see cobalt, which is used for batteries and catalyst magnets for the EU is like red, which is like high importance for its green technology and on top of the of the map of the list. Um, lithium, um, which is of course also for batteries, um, it's also like high importance, niobium. You have all of this, you know, list of materials which you can see here where they are and they're all basically in the countries where the EU is now um, concluding or negotiating trade agreements. So, you know, this this is like, I think very graphic. It just says everything, you know, like the EU is desperate to, to find ways to secure its access to these raw materials, not only access, but also to make sure that European industry is going to be there. And we see like, there's like a very obvious link to that. Another, Another um, table where you can see that Europe, you know, is like high dependence on basically all of the non-renewable resources. Um, and I think this is also interesting to see because the US is a bit less dependent, China is much less dependent, and Russia is very, like, not dependent on many of the non-renewable resources. Um, again, here you have the green giants, you have China, Australia, Brazil in aluminium. Cobalt, Congo, Russia, Australia, Copper, Chile, Peru, China, Lithium, Australia, Chile, China, Nickel, Indonesia, Philippines, Russia, Silver, Mexico, China, Peru. Again, a lot of the places where the EU is um, negotiating um, FTAs with energy and raw materials chapter in it. Um, I think, you know, some of the questions that raise from all of this um, strategy is, well, First, like what are the contradictions between these chapters, the energy and raw materials chapter, and the climate objectives of the EU? Because these chapters are also saying that there's going to be, you know, less tariffs and there's going to be more incentives to mine in these countries. So does that mean that there's going to be more mining? Um, do these chapters say anything about recycling of materials? Is it being prioritized? And no, it doesn't say anything about that. It just talks about facilitating more investment and more trade. Um, and here there's a good example that we're going to be listening more about Indonesia, because basically Indonesia has also been, um, you know, like reforming their domestic laws on how they're mining and extracting to you know, add more value to their process on extraction, which at the same time means that they actually would need to mine less because they, you know, they're gonna sell for higher prices with less need to mine more. Uh, but what these treaties are actually saying is no, Indonesia, we want you to actually let us mine more and extract more. Not we don't we don't care about you um, you know, adding value to the chain on how you're going to sell your materials. 
So yes, there's going to be probably a lot more of mining and extraction happening um, once these chapters are, once these treaties are passed. No, um, the impact to on the right to regulate to those countries. So basically, how much are these new treaties going to constrain the policy space for the countries that are trying to do a different way of developing um, their, you know, industrial policies and export policies? Um, and this is, you know, like a bit of the question that I think is like much center of it, because of course the EU is supporting a type of energy transition, which most of the times is not taking into account the geophysical limits of our planetary boundaries of minerals and materials, and also the, you know, like in general, like the amount of energy needed um, to produce all of this. And the EU is, you know, being a bit blind on this and very techno-optimist on continuing with the same paradigm of extractivism and forcing these countries basically into a free market economies. Um, so there is, of course, a question on what type of energy transition are we talking about and who is going to be leading this energy transition. And basically, these treaties, if they are a new form of neocolonialism on, you know, what I just said, like sticking to these old extractivism paradigms. Um, at the same time, I think there can be a challenge for us in terms of narrative, because um, it's not, well, I mean, it's clear for all of us that we're also entering into a, a moment of, you know, different crises, one of them being the energy crisis. So there's going to be a lot of, you know, push for signing these agreements from sometimes parties that may have had uh, a position more critical to FTAs in general. Now, with this new narrative on energy and the need to securitize, securitize our energy um, dependence and you know demand and supply, there might be a bit more push to hurry into signing these agreements because of this discourse of of needing like to secure those materials for our energy transition in the EU for our um, green deal, no. So, but but yeah, as I said, like there might be some problems in, um, yeah, trying to support on at the same time the not signing disagreements when we are like in a moment of energy um, crisis. So I just wanted to bring these questions maybe also open for debate or just to say that these are some things that we would like to to pay attention to. Um, and yeah, thanks. So this was just like a very basic introduction, but I guess now we can open the turn for comments or questions. I will give it back to you, Nelly.